DES permitting system. As you know, Mr. Chairman, and I believe you will hear others refer to this morning, court decisions in recent years have put pesticide applicators on a path of being required to obtain NPDES permits for applications made into over or near waters of the United States, even though such applications are already regulated by the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act, FIFRA. I have heard, as have others, that in the development of a permit to comply with the court's decisions that EPA has not conducted thorough outreach to the industry and to growers, has not effectively sought input from the regulated industry or state governments, has not relied on the best scientific information, has not clearly defined the waters that would require NPDES permits and those that would not, and it has not considered the practical implementations of proposals on products used, labels, etc., and has not considered the economic impacts of the permitting process or completed its consultation with other key federal agencies. With the deadline for issuance of the permit requirements coming this fall, and with an impact that even EPA admits will affect hundreds of thousands of applicators and millions of pesticide applications, the uncertainty and apparent lack of consideration in EPA's efforts is very troubling to my membership, particularly when it is also far from clear that an additional permit would provide significant additional protection to the environment. I am aware that the House of Representatives recently passed legislation to clarify that such permits are duplicative and unnecessary. I commend that action and urge the Senate to follow suit. However, I also hope that Congress will do everything it can to make EPA's efforts to develop a permit transparent, based on sound science, and with much needed input from the ag community. There are other specific issues that I touch upon in my paper here. Uh, but for time constraints, uh, I will just conclude by thanking you for the opportunity to appear before you uh, this morning and be happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, all witnesses should be aware your entire opening statements are going to be in the record uh, so that you don't need to, to fret that you get everything in in the first go round. Mr. Smith, as the baton passes. Good morning, Congressman Issa and our local congressman. Mr. Farr, I have to bring a point of order up about your introductory remarks because you talked about the salad bowl, but you failed to recognize that we have a balanced diet here. We've got beef cattle and wine, and you can have a complete meal in the Central Coast. Is, is salad complete unless you have a little cheese and, and, a, and a, a splash of wine? It, you you got to do the whole thing. you got to have a balanced diet. We and do by that, way, you know, the way, from San Diego, we I would ask you to a little orange juice in the morning would be good, too. <laughs> USDA puts out a recommended diet, and it's just fine. It's got a small glass of wine up in the corner. So, Didn't getting wine into the school lunch program. <laughs> <laughs> Sam's going to help us. <laughs> I am Richard Smith. I'm a grape grower from Soledad here in the Salinas Valley. I farm about 3,000 acres on 17 properties spread over 50 miles up and down the valley. My avocation apparently is to study and comment on sciences related to our ag political issues. I've studied and advocated for research, education, and extension, water issues, and technology and agriculture, understanding the physical, chemical, and biotechnological aspects of our business. I believe that legislation is the portal through which good ideas become part of a society's protocol. Unfortunately, in my opinion, our systems of legislation and regulation that exist today are dysfunctional. I think I sound like Tom. Um, they pose a significant problem for productive citizens. Assuming the legislation was well intended, and I will grant that for this discussion, <coughs> It's unfortunate that the legislation is generally followed by regulatory fiats created by unelected boards or administrative staff. These rules often compromise, complicate, or deviate from the original good intentions of the legislation. Regulations, enforcement of regulations, and the ensuing 
regulatory court cases ultimately create incremental new law. My sense of a dysfunctional legislative system is one that creates this extra legislative body of law. These rules and regulations are often not exposed to hearings or legislators. We agricultural producers <clears throat> eventually deal directly with the legal consequences of these rules and regulations. Generally, we're busy doing our job, or perhaps sleeping at the wheel, while various advocacies use the legal system to modify the well-intended laws into onerous regulations. We seldom pay any real attention to this insidious process. The Endangered Species Act is an ex imagine that we're all talking about that today. <laughs> is an example of a hypothetical good intent gone awry. I assume the ESA has a general intent to mitigate the loss of diverse species by identifying plants and animals at risk of extinction and providing mechanisms to mitigate those losses. However, the regulatory system developed to enforce the ESA has become an expensive barrier to almost any development. Any perceived loss of habitat or any isolated subspecies is a reason to stop a land use or an activity. This is the case even if there's no significant impact, even if a relatively unlimited habitat remains available to the species in question. Steelhead trout, leaf-billed vireo, red-legged frogs. Um, a local example is the concern about maintain, maintaining the red-legged frog habitat in the Salinas River in the face of the need for stream bed maintenance. Work planned to sustain the unimpeded flow of the mainstream to avoid floods does not impact significantly the available habitats of this frog species. The river is 150 miles long and there's many additional miles uh, along the tributaries. It's one of the many ESA issues that are protracting the process to get the appropriate permits to pursue this maintenance task. This obstruction shouldn't be the intent or the result of the ESA laws or rules. In fact, the Environmental Protection Agency, the Army Corps of Engineers, the National Marine Fisheries Service, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife, and probably at least four state agencies, all can be forced through petitions or courts to consider the ESA requirements and require an environmental impact report before approving any such maintenance task. This is a task that we successfully performed for almost 15 years after the 1995 flood. Sometimes I think that we in the community are wasting our time and money asking permission to do a responsible job. I wonder if we should force modifications in the EPA rules by filing our lawsuit. We can claim that the Water Resources <coughs> Agency created substantial risks by the changes in the river environment caused by the operation of the dams. A court should say that the Water Agency should manage that river to sustain an arid sub stream bed plant population like that which existed before we built the dams. There used to be only six months of annual stream flows along the Salinas River. Our continuous flow now supports a tremendous population of plants. Another federal lake regulatory bill, the Clean Water Act, also has many significant issues where I think the federal authority over land uses has extended way beyond the intent. That bill began with a limit to address navigable waters of America. Terms such as navigable waters, vernal pools, cut and fill operations, cultivation, drainage, a number of words have been interpreted and reinterpreted by the Army Corps, EPA, and the courts. The consequences of those interpretations keep lawyers employed almost without a break. Amendments from many diverse venues are being proposed to Congress with the purpose of clarifying the intent of this federal legisla legislation and the regulations that follow. This act has been modified to encompass far-reaching consequences. In California, we've written the Porter Cologne Act supposedly to further develop the intent of the Clean Water Act. State regulators, administrative staff, are proposing fiats that go way beyond the Clean Water Act intent. Porter Cologne is supposed to use the language and intent of the Clean Water Act, 
which specifically exempts agriculture from the definition of point source pollution, which the Clean Water Act is intended to address. New proposed regulations actually are scientifically unachievable. Successful research, education, and extension models of soil and water resource improvement projects are being abandoned. We've had a five or six year program of developing education and outreach. Uh, the system that's being proposed is a regulatory and enforcement regime, a system to raise operating funds with licenses and fees and penalties to support the administration of the government programs. Thank you for letting me voice a couple of issues here. More than a couple, but thank you. <laughs> Mr. Groot. Morning, Chairman Issa, Representative Farr. Appreciate the opportunity to be here. My name is Norm Groot, and I'm the Executive Director of Monterey County Farm Bureau, representing family farmers and ranchers in the interest of protecting and promoting agriculture throughout Monterey County. We strive to improve the ability of those engaged in productive production agriculture to provide a reliable supply of food and fiber through reasonable stewardship of our natural resources. Increasingly, this has become a difficult mission to 